On this video, we're going to revisit separable differential equations. Uh, that here we're going to work a few more examples, but we're going to add uh, a little bit deeper level of complexity to this and try to ask some, some more challenging questions. So here's our differential equation to start with. dy dx is equal to xy quantity squared. We have the initial condition that y is equal to 1 when x is equal to 1. We'll start by solving, so we need to separate the variables. So I'm going to first go ahead and square the xy quantity and call that x squared y squared. Then from there we can divide the y squared to the left side and multiply the dx to the right side. So I'm going to write that as y to the negative 2 dy is equal to x squared dx. We can then integrate both sides since we have separated the variables. On the left side, we're going to get a negative y to the negative 1. And remember, we're going to put the plus c on the x side. When we integrate x squared, we're going to get 1 third x cubed. Let me make that a more clear 3. So that's a 1 third x cubed plus c. Now, at any point in time, we can use the initial condition. I'm going to wait a little bit on it here. So let's see if we can multiply through by the negative 1 first. And I'm going to rewrite the y to the negative 1 as 1 over y. On the right side, when we multiply through by the negative 1, that's going to be a negative 1 third x cubed. And that plus c, we can still leave just as a plus c. It's still a constant that we are going to have to determine later. Now again, you could uh, find the initial condition, uh, use the initial condition now. I'm going to go one more step, and I'm going to take the reciprocal of both sides. Here you have to be a little bit careful. On the left side, the reciprocal of 1 over y is y. On the right side, you cannot do this independently, separately. So I'm going to write it as 1 big 1 over negative 1 third x cubed plus c. Now, I may come back and clean this up in a moment, but let's use the initial condition right now and plug in the 1 for y and the 1 for the x. So that's going to make that look like 1 over and then negative 1 third times 1 cubed is just negative 1 third plus the c. Now I'm going to try to solve this for c, so I'm going to go back to taking the reciprocal of both sides of the equal sign, and on the left side, the reciprocal of 1 is just 1, and on the right side, we're going to get negative 1 third plus c. Adding the 1 third to the other side, we're going to get that c is equal to 4 thirds. Now we'll plug that back into this expression for y, and so we're going to get 1 over negative one-third x cubed, and then plus four-thirds. Now, on an AP exam question, that would be great. Uh, you don't have to do anything more. Of course, uh, you know how this bothers your math teacher when you leave things looking messy like this. So uh, we would prefer not to have fractions in fractions. If I multiply the numerator and denominator of the big fraction by three, then that is going to make us have y equals 3 in the numerator, and that's going to be a negative x cubed when the 3 times 1 third cancels, plus 4, and then going one more step just to make it look nicer, let's say y is equal to, and then I'm going to write that as 3 over and 4 minus x cubed. So there is our particular solution to the differential equation. It's going to satisfy the differential equation, and it also satisfies the initial conditions. Now, what I want to do, uh, this was pretty complicated already. Let me ask one more question to think about. Uh, what is the domain of our new solution? So what is the domain of that, that function that solves the differential equation? And now what I'm trying to get you to think about is that we said a solution to a differential equation is only valid on a continuous domain. So when you look at the domain of 
this function, our solution, we can see that there is a vertical asymptote when the denominator is equal to zero. And so that is going to be when x is equal to the cube root of four. So at, cube root, at the cube root of four, uh, we're gonna get a vertical asymptote. So that's a discontinuity. So that breaks the domain for this function into two parts. Uh, a solution, this differential equation can only be valid to the right of x equals the cube root of four or to the left of x equals the cube root of four. And so now we have to go back and look at our initial condition and we see that that x that y was positive one when x was equal to one. So it's this x equal to one that is important here. Since the cube root of four is bigger than the cube root of one, which is one, that means that our initial condition is going to land to the right of this vertical asymptote. So that means our differential equation, our solution, is only valid on that part of the domain. That is, the domain of our solution is going to be x greater than the cube root of 4. I hope that makes sense. Let's try another example. We're going to do a different problem here, one that's going to pose some challenges as well. On this one, we're going to see that sometimes, not very often, but sometimes we are not going to be able to solve for the, the function y explicitly. Sometimes we will not be able to solve for y explicitly. And in that case, like we're going to see in this next example, we're just going to have to leave our solution as an implicit function. That is, the x's and y's are going to be hopelessly intertwined. So here is our differential equation. We've got x, y, dx plus e to the negative x squared times the quantity y minus 1 dy is equal to 0. And our initial condition is going to be that y of 0 is equal to 1. So this is uh, a little more complicated than examples we've seen previously. Remember, our, our goal is to separate our variables. So let's maybe, since the dy is on this side. Let's leave the dy term for now on the left side and let's move this xy dx to the right side of the equal sign. So that's going to give us e to the negative x squared times y minus 1 dy and that's going to make that equal to a negative xy dx once we subtract that xy dx term to the right side. So we're making progress. We've got the dy on the left side, so we want all y terms to end up there. So I'm going to divide that y to the left side. And simultaneously, I need to move this, this x term, the e to the negative x squared, over to the right side, where it will be with the dx term. So when I divide the y to the left, it's going to look like y minus 1 over y dy. And then I'm going to move the, the e to the negative x squared to the other side. So that's going to be a negative x dx. I'm dividing that by e to the negative x squared. Now, I'm going to have to do a little bit of work here before I'm ready to integrate both sides. So on the left side, you can notice, well, we can go ahead and write the integral for now, but we're not really ready to get an antiderivative yet. Let's do some work on that y minus 1 over y. Since the degree of the numerator is greater than or equal to the degree of the denominator, we could long divide, or I think it's easier because the denominator is a, a single term, we can split that up into y over y minus 1 over y dy. 
and then on the other side we are going to to move that negative exponent in the denominator the e to the negative x squared can move up into the numerator and become uh, e to the positive x squared so that's going to make that integral be a negative x e to the it'll now be positive x squared dx and so we're getting closer to the integrals that we're going to try to actually do so on the left side now the y over y is just 1 and then we have a minus 1 over y dy and on the right side we're looking at if we want we can bring that negative outside and have x e to the x squared dx so on the left side we're gonna do each of those integrals independently so the integral of 1 with respect to y is going to be just y and the integral of 1 over y we know is the natural log of the absolute value of y on the right side we're going to need a u substitution so if we say u is the exponent x squared then du is going to be 2x dx and the dx is going to then be du over 2x that's going to make our integral be there's the negative still on the outside there's the x that we had the e to the x squared we're now going to call e to the u and the dx it will be replaced by du over 2x so our dx accounts for that extra x term and so our integral when we pull that 2 all the way out it's in the denominator that's going to be one half integral of e to the u du and we know that is going to be a negative one half e to the u and we're going to go back to the x squared which was our what we called u so going back where we were to our solution uh, let me just point out here's where we left off we're going to now bring this term back up so it's going to be uh, let me go back to that same color so we've got a minus one half e to the x squared and then we're going to plug in our plus c now as you look at this you can see well we can use our initial condition so we had that uh, y of 0 was equal to 1 so we can try plugging all that stuff in now and I'm gonna bring that over here so when we plug in the 1 for y we're getting we're getting 1 and then minus the natural log of 1 and then minus 1 half e raised to the 0 and then uh, where did I lose my equal sign there I think back up here I think I missed it I dropped the equal sign here I'm gonna bring it back in there now so that was equals and there's the negative 1 half so that means that we had this natural log we had 1 minus natural log 1 and let me put the equal sign back in there that's where the equal sign should have been then we've got negative one half times e to the zero and then our plus c so we can see that the natural log of one is zero so we have one is equal to negative one half plus c which means that c is going to be three halves so at this point in time <clears throat> we now have our our solution we've got so I'm gonna bring this down here with our C so we have Y minus the natural log of the absolute value of Y and we can see from our initial condition that we're choosing the Y values that are going to be positive so I can get rid of those absolute values now and just go with the natural log of y that's equal to and now we've got our negative one half e to the x squared 
and our C we said was plus three halves. Now this is pretty hopelessly going to be, uh, let me hold on a second, did I do that right? I think I did. Okay, so at this point in time, we can see that there's no way we're going to get y completely by itself because there's that y um, embedded into that logarithm, and there's another y that isn't in there. Just for aesthetics, if we wanted, we could multiply through by 2 to get rid of some of those fractions, and I think the best that we're going to get, or the nicest looking result we will be able to get, is going to be 2y minus 2 natural log of y is equal to uh, negative e to the x squared plus 3. And as you can see, that's an implicit function of y. We haven't solved for y explicitly. So that is can happen. That's an option for what may happen sometimes. Okay? I'm going to do one more example. And this uh, is one that we've talked about before, but it's been a little while. We talked about it in the context of the fundamental theorem of calculus, but we are going to use that fundamental theorem of calculus to construct a solution to a differential equation. To construct a solution to, and I'm going to call it an initial value problem. Initial value problem. That means it's a differential equation together with initial conditions. So our differential equation is going to be dy dx is equal to e to the negative x squared. And our initial condition is going to be given as f of 7 is equal to 3. And we're going to try to construct a solution to that differential equation. So you can see what's happening, or maybe you can see, that if we try to integrate, if we separate the variables, dy equals e to the negative x squared dx, there is no closed form solution to the integral of e to the negative x squared. So we're not going to be able to write down uh, a function for that. So instead, what we're going to do is remember that from our fundamental theorem of calculus, we can say that we can create a function whose derivative is whatever we want it to be as an integral function. So we're going to say for a moment, uh, channeling that uh, fundamental theorem of calculus, that we're going to construct a function from some constant a to x, and we're going to call this e to the, and we're going to call it something other than x, so I'm going to call that e to the negative t squared dt. So if you remember from the fundamental theorem of calculus that this has as its derivative, so f prime of x, if that's our f, is going to be just e to the negative x squared. So it is going to solve our differential equation. So if you remember, we can now make it also satisfy the initial condition that f of 7 is 3 if we, say, if we note that the integral from 3 to x of e to the negative t squared dt, that is, we choose this constant a to be to be 7, I didn't write that correctly, let me go 7, that f of 7 would be the integral from 7 to 7, which is 0. We want it to be 3, and so we'll add that 3 in. And so this, the claim is that this, is a constructed function. So we've defined a function as an integral, and it will satisfy both the differential equation that is, its derivative is going to be e to the negative x squared, and also the initial condition that when you plug in 7 for x, you will get 3 for y. Very good.